So uh, that's my uh, Twitter handle, at Matteo Collina. Please ask me questions, whatever. I reply most of the time. So uh, I'm here today to talk about the Node.io. You might ask why Node. Well, I am part of the Node.js technical steering committee. So whatever, a lot of things Node.js. If you have questions about Node Core, ping me. Um, so uh, I'm also a, a principal architect in the Air Form. We are a professional service company. This, distributed all around the globe, but based in Ireland, whatever. If you need us, we are there, check, it out. check us out. Um, also, another little bit of intro, there is these slides. If you have a laptop, uh, there are some interactive visualizations, so if you have a laptop out and you want to play with them, these are the slides, you can take a picture, whatever, whatever you want. Um, so, let's get started. Um, when everybody starts with Node, they start with a very simple question how to debug asynchronous activity. You know, you have a socket coming in or an HTTP request coming in and you want to react to, um, to those activity. And you know, what everybody does, oh well, I can use the inspector protocol, the inspector, Chrome inspector, and I just, uh, yeah, more or less. But what if we have 10 concurrent requests, 100? How can I de uh, debug an application running in production where I have a lot of concurrency in place. Uh, in other, I came from the Java world, whatever. I've done this and this, I've said it. Uh, you could stop a thread, single thread, and just debug that. You can't do that in Node. So, uh, most of the stuff is because Node.js is based on a concept called the event loop. And you probably are familiar with the Node event loop. Um, okay, how many of you think you are familiar with the Node event loop? Okay, how many of you have seen this? <laughs> ah, less people. This is this, the secret sauce, okay? That's the most hidden piece of node lore that you can find. Took six months to write that guide. Please read it if you want to know more about how node works. And this is how the node event loop works. Probably not really easy to understand. So let's switch to a more uh, easy to uh, uh, understand version because probably a little bit more uh, clear to everybody. So when JavaScript uh, is ex executes, the only thing that uh, a node application does when it leads to I.O., it, it talks to the uh, kernel async I.O. barrier or the thread pool and says, when this event happens, when this condition happens, please call, back, call a function when this finishes. That's the only thing that, uh, that node does. And it is specified, it passes in a JavaScript function, and you know, some event happens, like uh, you are receiving some data from a socket, and that it calls back, and then it wants to call that function. How does that happen? There is a, let's see, whoa, there is an event queue here, and the event queue means that the, all the functions are processed one at a time. Um, so, just to repeat, uh, the JavaScript runtime specify a, a, a function as a listener to some I.O. event. And then the I.O. event happens and the function is called. But, you know, there is one corollary to all of this. We have only one function executing at any given time. And this is one of the key tenets of any Node.js uh, Node function. Now you might ask why all of this matter when doing asynchronous activity. Would it make these things simpler? Yes and no. It makes things simpler to code. However, there is one key piece that is uh, a little bit obscure, which knowing which code is running relative to one another. Um, also, what about next tick promises and set immediate? Now, which one will run first? If you schedule a promise, if you run a promise, if you do next tick, or if you do set immediate, you know? I'm not throwing set timeout zero in there because that's even trickier. So, next tick are always executed uh, before uh, promises are resolved and uh, before any other I.O. events. Promises are, if you do new promise, the function is executed synchronously but then resolved asynchronously and before any other I.O. events. Set immediates instead exercise the full event loop that we told you, that we've told you, you know, and they've not thrown in set immediate set timeout zero because that's another level of complication. So uh, again, uh, the hardest piece of information, the other 
thing that when a newbie starts working with Node is uh, to know when a chunk of code is executed relative to one another. So going back to the question, how to debug uh, uh, multiple asynchronous activity? How do we do this? Because you know, we have multiple things happening. How do we, we have a bad bug and that is happening only when I'm calling three different routes at the same time and the moon is aligning and Mars is over there, I don't know. It really gets complicated and oh, I don't understand what, what is happening in here. It's very hard. So it goes back to, to a problem and something that we are missing in JavaScript, which is the concept of the asynchronous context. So let's look at a very, very basic HTTP server written in Node.js. And you can see that we do our HTTP create server and we pass in a function. This function, in fact, when we receive an HTTP request from a browser, you have a new uh, logical asynchronous context that is being created, which means, you know, this is your transaction. This is your HTTP request and response. This is a logical concept that is living in there, okay? All the things that descend from this one will be, you know, linked one with another, mainly because they are part of the same closure. You see, there's a closure created here. So they are part of the same closure. And then when I create another closure, you know, ah, it's in here. Okay, and, um, and the context is being, the response is being propagated just by using that. Um, so it's really powerful, right? However, uh, there is no concept of asynchronous context in the JavaScript language. So, you know, it's something that is built in into how closure works and how the event loop works, but there is no way to control in any uh, uh, reflection-oriented way these type of things. So it's completely a logical con construct, but it's not a language, not a language feature. There is some work in making this a reality where there's actually a concept in the language pack and some of the work, you can find some of the work done by the diagnostics working group in Node.js. Check it out and this goes a little bit into the deep depths of this and it's really, really uh, interesting to read. Um, then, well, if there's no concept of, of, of uh, synchronous context, how can we track uh, IEO events. So how can we know when things happen, you know? Uh, there is a thing called async hooks. You have probably heard about async hooks in the past, and it's one of those, you know, uh, new features of Node.js that, do, that can do great things. Also, you know, they are somewhat hard to use. This is an example of using them. This is actually real, real code. Uh, can you understand what it does? Well, it's complex. And um, it also generates a lot of data, and I'm not going to explain it because it's a really deep conversation. So uh, myself and my team, we have worked for six months trying to make sense about all this stuff and how to provide a way to reason about the asynchronous context and the asynchronous activity in Node.js. So, uh, you know, and when you have this type of question, the best way to attack these problems, you know, I am a software engineer, okay, by trade, whatever. Uh, so, you know, you go, oh, well, you ask a designer, sorry, we can't do this. So I ask, we ask, I ask a designer, hey, can you please sit down, we do a little bit of a design workshop, whatever, to figure this out. Turns out that the, um, the answer to the question on how to visualize asynchronous activity is uh, bubbles. So, <laughs> bubbles, <laughs> yeah, that's it. So, let's make an example. We have, we have a nice, very tiny piece of, uh, as, uh, of code here, okay? It's the same server that we were talking about before. You. So we go to, oh, our lights, so hey. So we go to our, um, so we are here and we have that code. Now we can use this tool called BubbleProf and it's part of a sweet code clinic. Uh, you might check it out later, there's a some links. And AutoCannon is a tool to generate some load, so we are putting in a thousand requests just to spice things up. Uh, to know how things behave in production. And basically, you run your code, long, I probably have typed. Yeah, you, we run our code. Now you can see that AutoCannon is pinning things up a little bit and running a little bit of those requests. Um, and it's basically now generating our visualization. Take some time, you know, this machine is not powerful at all. And this is a, 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 a bubble profit diagram. Now I'm zooming in. And um, so what we can see on, on the right side is the number of asynchronous operations being done of, uh, by this system. 
And you can see that it's doing, you know, we have uh, 12,000 asynchronous resource being created by running a 1,000 uh, requests in Node.js. Does this app help anybody? Maybe yes, maybe no. The key important part are way further down. We can start from the root. So when the root, this is the root node, and uh, represent the starting point of your application, yeah. Then we can go deep and you know, see the first part. And the first part, in fact, it's on line 20 of our application, basic.js, whatever it is. And it's our call to server.listen. Our server is, is starting to listen on stuff. Still, this is not helping me in, the, in knowing what is happening in my Node application. So the next part, it's this big block here, which is a bunch of network activity, which is, you can see it in, in green. And this bunch of network activity, it's there's some bunch of empty frames. These are uh, Node Core stuff. But then we have a bunch of another Node Core stuff, which come from how we receive a TCP connection in Node.js itself. So you know that you are receiving a TCP connection on Node.js. When you receive an HTTP request, you got an HTTP, a TCP connection being open. After this, uh, you c after this, actually, the, the key part of our application, which is our uh, uh, set timeout. Now, you know, you see there is a set timeout happening here, and you see a fork. And you can ask, why is, is there a fork? Now, you can see two things. First of all, the execution continue on the left because there's a big arrow. That will give you a hint that the execution continue on the left. But our execution forks, white forks. Well, on the right, you can see that you know, it starts a set timeout okay, on the right. But then on the, on the left, it's when uh, it's our promise dot then, OK? It's the, it's, a, it's the resolution of the promise itself. So here it is. Um, and there is a tiny bit of thing in the middle of node core bits and bobs where things are you know, uh, executed. So, um, so the, you know, these things is, is, is clear enough. And we have a bunch of stuff the node core does when it finishes. And you know, it's, for example, in here we are calling uh, a response dot end, which is where we send our response back to the user. So we were talking this, okay, you know, this I understand, is this is matches, is matches my understanding. Now, let's spice things up a little bit. Now, let's do a little quick refactoring on this system. And well, if you are following, there is the full theme of this thing, the generator one. Let's switch to the uh, async await, to an async await version. This is functionally, functionally, functionally equivalent to the previous one. Note that we are using dot .catch. Always put a dot .catch when you're doing these type of things, because otherwise you will leak a, a file descriptor and you know, make popcorn of your servers. So uh, don't do that. Put a catch in your, in, when you're calling promises. So um, you need, you know, we are doing this. So let's try. Let's see if it's the same as before. How many people think it's the same? How many people think it's different? Somebody knows. Somebody knows. So this is the, is, is this, is the, let me zoom in, okay? So you can see that this is actually different from the previous one. It generates a different diagram. Why? Well, first of all, we can note that we are actually using more asynchronous resources. Note that promises are asynchronous resources because they are scheduled in, there's going to be a synchronous activity happening in the future. So you see that we are scheduling 2,000 more promises, more or less, than before. Why is that? And the reason comes in the way the uh, async, await, uh, async await is specified. And you know, for every await that you do, you allocate a bunch of promises that are not necessarily needed. And they're going to be removed and you know, fixed in later version of the spec. I can send you some links if you are interested. So, and you can see the difference here that you know, we have our handle function and then we have our async await function and it gets split in two. And there is a bunch of tiny thing in here which says one frame with no file and this is, you know, there are some throwaway, called throwaway promises in it. You, know, it gets, you see some artifacts due to how promises work. And, you know, and this is a completely another throwaway promise that goes nowhere. This promise is completely like, generated to just fulfill some spec need, whatever. Uh, anyway, uh, this is with async await. And you know, then another step, interesting, it's let's just use callbacks. You know, 
why we are using this type of thing? Why can't we just use callbacks? And let's do another example, just calling FS read file, one of the primitives of Node.js. So we go back here and we are running our files example. And I can press in tab, but it's not a really good idea. So a lot of files in there. So we are running it and generating some bunch of things. And here we go. Um, some magic, sprinkling, I don't know. Here we go. Now, you can see there is another, a, a slightly different one. This is fully linear, let me zoom in, okay? You can see in this blob, in this block, there's a lot of brown activity, which is our reading of files, a bunch of scheduling activity, which is the purple, and then some green one, which is data. So we have these blocks of brown activity in here that you can see. And you know, the first, let's click on the first one, and the first one is our F1 function. And you can see, oh, maybe we are reading a file. So this is scheduling our read of the file. Then we have this next block afterwards, which is in fact a combination of three different asynchronous activities. Because Node.js, in order to read that file, is actually accessing the file system three times. And it's completely hidden for you. You just call fs read file, but it's segmented and it makes things interleaved so that it, you can use multiple asynchronous activity at the same time. And he's doing three, and he's doing three things. And he's calling this function read file after open, which is totally a node core thing. And we are not, should not really worry too much about it. And now we have the first, we have the first file, and then the second file, and then the third file. Okay, this seems, I can understand this. So let's switch to uh, async await, okay? Now you should have learned, we should have seen that it changes significantly the structure of my application. And it's, uh, um, it's, actually very, uh, it's actually very useful because it moved from something that is very hard to read and very hard to maintain to something that is way better to read and maintain. So yeah, I like it, right? Um, I'm a fan, by the way. And um, so what is happening is now you can see that the, the actual uh, bubble prof art, as we call it, it's uh, is slightly different than, than before because you can see that there is uh, way more scheduling activity happening. And you can see where the throwaway promises are. So there is a throwaway promise here. Because we are actually calling a sync await three times. I say await three times. So we have three th throwaway promises. And we have one here, one here, and one here. Now, there is, uh, and we can now understand how things are getting interleaved between each other. And how we can use this information to write better code and maybe fix problems. One more thing, it's we have written our, our code in this way. Now, we can also very quickly rewrite our code to be in, pa in parallel. Note that changing a bunch of callback hell functions to be parallel, it's hard. Doing it with async await is a matter of changing three lines of code, so benefits there. Note that I'm not using a wait. And let's see how it goes. Take some time. Here we go. Let's zoom in. And now, now you can see that, in fact, the, tr the three throwaway promises that we were talking before have, gone, uh, have disappeared and we now have our only three blocks of reading our files. And we can unpack this wrap, and you can see that, you know, there is all the, the things where it gets generated properly and stuff like that. And there is a lot of uh, information that you, can, that you can gather from this tool and to visualize your asynchronous activity and understand how your, your node process works. In fact, you've done some analysis on some, some open source modules. This is from, um, uh, uh, a library called IPFS, and uh, it's a distributed web platform, and we have done some optimizations in there. And um, there was some, some, uh, there was things that could be improved, and you can see there is a lot of activity in here, a lot of things that are, you know, chained together and so on and so forth. And um, you can read all of this in this issue if you are interested. It's a long, it's a long, long, long paper of explanation on what was the problem, how, how we fix it. In the end, we fixed it, we got a 30% performance improvement. So, eh, it was nice. It was, was, was a nice one, okay? Um, 
So let's go a little bit into some performance consideration on how you write your node application and how to improve them. So, you know, um, we have talked a little bit about the event loop and now the fact that your I.O. runs one at a time, right? And we schedule functions. So when we receive a request and uh, there is, um, we schedule some activity to happen in the future, we set a function into our uh, event loop ma machinery, right? and they will call me back when it's finished. So when there is a slow I.O. operation, that function will stay alive longer, okay? Which means that I can accept more stuff from, I can accept more requests before returning, right? That's what everybody will do. Oh, well, I have capacity. I'm not doing anything, I'm idle. So I'll get more data from, you know, I'll accept more HTTP requests. So, um, yeah, it's, Increase the amount of concurrent tasks because I have more CPU bandwidth now. I'm waiting for stuff to happen so I can execute stuff. Good. However, uh, the more you increase the concurrency, uh, the more you increase the memory consumption. Why? Well, we have a, for each one that we receive, we are allocating new closures. So, new closure gets allocated, new objects, and all of these occupy memory, which is you know, pressures in most systems. Um, the moment you increase memory consumption, you increase, uh, you make the work of the nice garbage collector harder. Why? Well, because you, you are, he has more stuff to clean up. And you will, it's, it's work, it's, even the, the performance of the garbage collector is getting better and better and better and better and better and better and better, and better every year. Um, we are scheduling more stuff every year, to, every moment to do more or less. So uh, it increased the pressure on the garbage collector to, uh, to do work. And these, um, at a garbage collector, where does it run? Is it magic? No, it's not magic. It runs on a CPU. And you know, when you are working on a container system or are deploying Node.js in production, you are doing, um, you probably have one or two or three maybe cores, I don't know. Italy, most of the time, once, one core. So if a garbage collector is running, maybe my node process cannot run. So we have a problem there, okay? There is contention. So in the end, um, and so this means that the garbage collector will steal my CPU cycles. Perfect. And will steal my CPU cycle from the JavaScript uh, uh, critical path, which is, um, which is a little bit uh, a tricky thingy. So um, the net result is that in a Node.js application, latency and throughput are tightly connected. So the moment you see an increase in latency, you will see also likely a decrease in, in throughput, mainly because they are linked together by the, uh, the way the node works and the fact that typically it can take a huge amount of high concurrency uh, compared to other platforms. And, and this is one of the things that, you know, having, doing it as a job to go through and uh, putting Node.js application in production, uh, it's one of the most misunderstood concepts about, about Node.js and think, thinking that these two concepts, latency and throughput, are not connected to each other. And you, you should always remember this. Um, so the, this tool is part of the Clinic JS suite. You can find it there. It's there. There is also a video of me speaking. Whatever. Um, so if you need some help in improving the performance of your Node.js application, reach out. Hey, say hi. And yeah, that's it. And uh, again, the slides. You probably want to check them out. I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully yes. Hopefully no. I will tweet about them sooner rather than later. Somebody's taking a picture. Thank you. I put it. I did put it there for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, and uh, thank you. <laughs>